Bonjour à tous. Welcome back to our penultimate session of the Nature for Life Hub. On day four, local action, we have been honored to present to you conversations about rights, activism, and local solutions. The next conversation is not different, and it helps us reimagine what it looks like to take these solutions to scale. I am excited to present this next session, Local Action, Global Impact, Scaling Up Local Action for Nature. Enjoy. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning, everyone. And again, thank you for joining us today on Community Day. Um, I have the pleasure of moderating this session looking at local action, global impact. Uh, on behalf of Conservation International and the UNDP Global Environmental Facility Small Grants Program, we are pleased to be able to host this event today. And what we're really gonna focus on is local action and global impact. How can we support communities to have more effective impact in their, in their territories, at the national level and ultimately at the global level. Communities are the solution to our climate and biodiversity crisis and how can we support them? So in this first segment, we're gonna have a seven, a five lightning talks by uh, individuals who are participating in various activities across the globe. Then we'll be followed by a panel discussion looking at how we can continue to support and scale up these endeavors. I wanna bring on our first uh, speaker, Lola Kabnal, and she is Maya Kechi. Uh, Kiche uh, from Guatemala, and she is uh, on the UN Red platform for forest and climate that's composed of 65 countries. So let's hear from her experience. Lola? Buenos dias a todas y todos. Es un gran placer para mí poderles brindar un saludo fraterno desde este lugar y saber también que todos están bien a pesar de las situaciones que enfrenta cada uno de nuestros países. Soy Lola Cabnal, mujer maya de una comunidad rural del municipio de Livingston, departamento de Izabal, en Guatemala. Trabajo para la asociación Actenamit, eh, pues también eh, colaboro para incidir en las diversas instancias, en los espacios a nivel nacional y a nivel internacional, en los temas que están en agendas de discusión política de gobiernos, como el cambio climático, eh, biodiversidad, derechos colectivos de pueblos indígenas y entre otros temas, como el tema de, de, de género también, ¿verdad? Entonces, estamos en esos espacios y es para mí poder compartir este espacio, es muy importante. Eh, Como es de nuestro conocimiento, eh, la Plataforma de Naciones Unidas para el Clima y los, y los Bosques, junto con el programa de pequeñas donaciones, eh, hace unos años eh, pusieron a marcha un programa comunitario eh, llamado Red Plus, conocido como CBR+. ¿verdad? Eh, este programa eh, tiene como objetivo, tenía como objetivo de fomentar la acción comunitaria en el ámbito de Red Plus y capacitar a las comunidades indígenas y forestales para influir en las políticas nacionales de Red Plus. Su objetivo lo dice, es para que los pueblos indígenas tengan la capacidad de poder influir en las políticas nacionales sobre el tema de Red Plus. Su primera fase eh, recibió un apoyo de Noruega y con esto pues se pudo eh, financiar varios proyectos comunitarios en seis países pilotos y eso significó algo muy importante para cada uno de estos países. Entonces la, eh, este programa de CBR+, se estableció entonces para conocer y promover el papel de los pueblos indígenas y las comunidades forestales en los procesos nacionales de Red Plus, ya que son los, los pioneros en, 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 en guardar nuestros bosques. Para nosotros es como los guardianes y guardianas de bosques, ¿verdad? Eh, Y eso pues eh, ayuda a, a, a cuidar y a manejar de una manera más, de, más adecuada nuestras zonas forestales. Eh, y como son bosques únicos igual, ¿verdad? Sirvió también para integrar los derechos, 
los medios de vida y los territorios de los pueblos indígenas y las comunidades forestales en las políticas y programas de Red Plus. Eso pues eh, es una ventaja bastante grande porque también esto ayudó a fomentar ese proceso. Y es eh, en concreto, ¿verdad? El CBR más contribuyó a informar eh, las políticas, más que informar quizás a socializar y a... Y a a dar a conocer ¿verdad? las políticas nacionales en los seis países piloto. Y esto promovió también las capacidades e innovaciones locales para la conservación y la gestión sostenible de los bosques, con un enfoque socialmente inclusivo e igualitario. Decimos igualitario porque ya vamos a ver cómo este eh, también eh, pudo integrar varios grupos en, en este proceso. Por ejemplo, en Gamboya, el, este programa fortaleció a las comunidades locales y a los dirigentes religiosos para proteger mejor sus bosques. Los, eh, muchas veces los, los eh, dirigentes religiosos no se toman en cuenta en cada uno de los países, e incluso los, los, en, a nivel local. ¿Por qué? Porque tienen una misión y se considera que que no pueden estar en, en esto, pero realmente este programa apoyó también o aportó para integrar estos grupos y, y, y así pues eh, se pueden apoyar entre sí. En la cuenca del Congo, el, C, el CBR+, más empoderó a las mujeres indígenas en cuestiones forestales, convirtiéndolas en guardianes de los bosques, quizás no convirtiéndolas, porque nosotras hemos dicho que siempre hemos sido guardianas de nuestros bosques, nosotros somos las que cuidamos, las que protegemos y por eso nos de denominamos así como pueblos indígenas y contribuyendo así a asegurar sus derechos y medios de vida. Y como también en Paraguay apoyó y fortaleció a los pueblos indígenas de manera in inusuales permitiéndoles por primera vez acceder directamente a la financiación pública y a gestionarlas. Esto es muy importante, porque las comunidades, nosotros hemos mencionado siempre que las comunidades tienen la capacidad de poder administrar, gestionar y, y ejecutar financiamientos, que muchas veces no se reconoce, pero sí es muy importante, ¿verdad? Por eso es que creemos de que esto es muy importante para los pueblos indígenas. Eh, este también eh, prestó apoyo a las mujeres de la comarca de, de, de una comarca en Paraguay, ¿verdad? Aunque realmente los países pilotos que se pudieron apoyar con esto, pues quizás no todos eh, tienen, eh, se, se establecieron proyectos, pero en algunos, en algunas comunidades de estos países, ¿verdad? En, en, Sri, en Sri Lanka, SBR+, apoyó la formación de un sistema de vigilancia forestal dirigido por la sociedad civil y que recibió el reconocimiento favorable de gobierno. Y esto es para nosotros muy importante debido que es tan, eh, eh, tan importante que la sociedad civil eh, tenga ese reconocimiento favorable ante un gobierno, porque muchas veces eso no se, no se lleva a cabo, ¿verdad? Y cuesta mucho incidir para el reconocimiento, pero este programa promovió eso y otras eh, diferentes innovaciones de este tipo, ¿verdad? Y empoderó claramente a los hombres, a las mujeres y a las organizaciones indígenas en la protección y el uso sostenible de, de sus bosques, asegurando que las acciones de Red Plus promuevan los derechos de los pueblos indígenas y la igualdad eh, de de género entre mujeres y hombres, ¿verdad? Y también este programa ha fomentado la participación de actores en el, en el cambio climático nacional. Por ejemplo, el CBR+, respon, re, re, proporcionó una plataforma para los diálogos de actores para el diseño de los NDCs en algunos de los países pilotos. Y eso es muy importante porque muchas de las comunidades locales o, los, o los, las autoridades locales o comunitarias o pueblos indígenas no conocemos cuáles son esas posibilidades que podamos tener nosotros como, como, como pueblos indígenas o comunidades locales para poder ir a dialogar, porque muchas veces no se conocen las agendas políticas, pero este promueve ese espacio y eso es muy importante para cada uno de nosotros. Gracias, Lola. Thank you so much. And I think what we heard from Lola today is the importance of the recognition and respect for indigenous peoples and local communities as gardens, guardians of the forest. But at the same time, looking at how you look at Red Plus 
and the importance of indigenous people's voice and role and capacities in executing these endeavors and supporting their communities. Right now, I wanna be able to pass it on to George Orstein, who is the country program manager for the UNDP Jeff Small Grants Program. And he's gonna provide us into some insights into Comdex and the Sotoyama Initiative. And he's coming to us from Ghana. Thank you. George, you're gonna to need to unmute. You muted yourself. Could you unmute? Thank yeah. you so much. Go yeah. ahead. Right. I'm presenting uh, the Jeff Small Grant Program, uh, which, as you are aware, was uh, came into force in 1992 after the Rio Convention. And basically, it is concerned with uh, giving support to rural communities for environmental management and also for livelihood uh, development. It operates on the assumption that uh, if you support the rural people, they're able to manage their resources more efficiently. Now, in, 19, in 2012, the uh, Satoyama Initiative, which is being uh, managed by the Japan uh, Biodiversity Program, Japan Ministry of uh, Environment, they provided funding to support the implementation of community uh, development and knowledge based initiative, which is using the Satoyama uh, strategy. The Satoyama strategy actually is looking at a landscape level intervention where the local communities are empowered to be able to manage their resources efficiently. It operates with five major principles. And the first principle is that you have to give recognition to the community cultural and spiritual values that is uh, already operating in the area. You have to also give recognition to the livelihood of the people so that they'll be able to have their own resources and then be able to support. It also operates on the issue that you have to support the people to manage the ecosystem uh, more efficiently. It also operates on the fact that you need to negotiate the landscape objectives and goals with some base uh, indicators. So this is how uh, the whole project started. In Ghana, we implemented this project within the uh, Volta region. It's a mountainous area and also a savanna uh, ecosystem. We entered into with the uh, strategy that sort of bring all the people together to think about their landscape, what they have to do in order to bring it back into uh, functioning to meet the needs and demands of the people. A five-year uh, strategic plan was developed together with the people you know, under the participatory manner. And then it ensured that there was social inclusion, that the gender, youth, and also the disabled persons were informed. And also there was the need for a transformation of some of the activities that were being implemented and infusing innovation into their system so that the people will be able to adapt new practices. Now, this project actually supported 35 <clears throat> rural communities with some uh, funding, and they were able to reforest their land. They were able to restore the degraded land. They were able to promote uh, restoration of uh, mountain areas and also the savanna areas as well. They also integrated their livelihoods, and that enables them to be able to uh, have a full grips on the resources. Now, through these interventions, the people were able to re restore the ecosystem. And this has contributed to the attainment of the ACHI targets 1, 12, 15, and 18, and also the Sustainable Development Goal 15 and 6. Also, they introduce agro ecosystem and food security systems, where the people were able to revive some of the indigenous foods that were almost going extinct. And among them are the indigenous rice, which is now being packaged and being processed for sale. Again, also, they promoted sustainable livelihood activities, which included uh, apiculture, that is a uh, beekeeping. And this has gone to a long, a long way to provide the livelihood and it is being bottled for export. Again also, the project was able to revive the institutional setup 
There was the indigenous or the traditional institution, and then also the modern institution. There was a fusion between the government agencies and the local agencies that together worked to sustain the uh, landscape. And also a lot of innovation was introduced in the agriculture. Krami Smart Agriculture was introduced. Cocoa Agroforestry was introduced. Um, agroforestry landscape system was also introduced. And this has helped to revive and to revamp the entire ecosystem. What we are now seeing is the following. One, there is a widespread agro, cocoa agroforestry intervention. The small scale uh, activities has now spread to about 345,000 hectares of landscape involving 126 communities. The indigenous practices, which hitherto was being considered as uh, heinous, is now being adopted and mainstreamed into the community activities. And this is also gradually catching up. There has been a revival of culture. There has been a revival of festival, which is bringing back the ecosystem and also ecotourism uh, within the area. Agriculture biodiversity has also picked up very greatly. People have adopted new systems of farming and improved using organic instead of the chemical, you know, replacing fertilizer with organic fertilizer. There has also been a strong partnership with CSOs. About 35 CSOs have come together to form what they call the Weto platform. And this platform is being used to transform the landscape and all the uh, other related activities as well. The last element is the policy shift. There has been a policy uh, shift in terms of promoting ecotourism, in terms of having laws that prohibit burning, that is bushfire and other uh, illegal system. A policy to prevent illegal harvesting of wood, that is timber. And also they have introduced village saving, which actually you not know, the people are involved in raising money at their own level. So the Satoyama Initiative has actually brought a change within the landscape. And as uh, we all know, it is being replicated in other landscape within the country. So I'll say that the entire program has been able, uh, first and foremost, to generate global benefits. Global benefits to biodiversity, climate change, sustainable land management, international water, and also chemical as well. It has also been able to reduce the friction that usually exists between the traditional system and then the, uh, the formal system. Now there's a cohesion and there is broader adoption and the scaling up of all these things and replication as well. There is a program to mainstream the whole thing into the agricultural uh, activities of the uh, Volta region. Thank you very much. I mean, we've built on the experience of hearing from Lola, uh, looking at indigenous peoples and local communities as guardians and supporting their efforts to promote their territories and management. Um, we just heard from the experience of George with the UNDP small grants brother that's built on the Sotoyama initiative that looks at these set of principles, but it looks at a larger landscape level and how you integrate the various actors and how you base it on cultural values that help building and healing not only nature, but the communities around them. Um, but these have had multiple benefits. They've replicated globally. Um, and uh, they're also achieving the, the Convention on Biological Diversity targets. Um, we're gonna take a brief pause to be able to hear a little bit more about the small grants program for a short video, and then we'll come back to our next speaker.
Thank you. And now we're going to pivot a little bit and we're going to look at the issues of tenure. I'm pleased to introduce Nonette Royo, who is the executive director of the tenure facility. She is from the Philippines, but is now based in Sweden. And she's going to talk to you a bit about the experience of supporting uh, indigenous and local communities in the process of tenure and what that has meant. Nonette, over to you. Thank you. Greetings, everyone, from the tenure facility here in Stockholm, Sweden. I'm honored to be here with my colleagues who are all funders of Indigenous Peoples. And uh, for the event earlier today, my deep thanks to UNDP and the partners to find, recommend, screen, and really uh, add more inspired stories to what we are knowing and understanding and learning from. My congratulations to the 2020 Equator Prize winners also. So the Tenure Facility Initiative is a is a specific initiative, a financial mechanism dedicated to collective land rights recognition to increase the protection of 50% of the world's land and forest resources already occupied and managed by indigenous peoples and local communities, but of which only 10% of their land tenure over those areas are recognized. We fund directly also like all of us, Indigenous Peoples and Local Community Partners, who with their associates, in this case for the tenure facility, allies and networks in key developing countries in Asia, Latin America and Africa, gathered together with Rights and Resources Initiative in 2014, initially funded by CEDA and founded the tenure facility and aimed to scale tenure at, from at least nine to 24 million hectares of forest lands by 2022. As we speak, evidence-based claims submitted to governments are already at 12 million hectares and 7 million hectares have been recognized. And that is a uh, quantity, but quality is interesting. Like most of us here in the panel, we work with a cluster of partners that intersect, complement, share practical tools, field sites, and policy wins to sustain the effort, to make sure that when we finish, they continue. So we meet halfway with indigenous and local community partners at key junctures in their journeys, having advanced their own rights and how now needed focused, larger, dedicated funding from one to four years to, impl to implement the hard won laws and regulations and agreements. And these even court decisions, and in some cases, peace pact agreements to recognize them. This will secure their position when they have their collective land title over these lands, and that will secure our climate, biodiversity, water, food, and many others. So how, how do we do this? How do we scale up? We fund, and then they scale up. And what do we fund? It's really tenure. So it's important to acknowledge that all of our work taken together um, on supporting indigenous peoples and local communities tenure is a necessary requisite, but it isn't the scale up, it's them who scale up. So all of our Equator Prize winners today, uh, it's very inspiring at field level, we know that even, and despite our projects ending, they will continue and are scaling up. So it takes a community, partnerships, trust, technology, local champions with a vision, swift follow-up actions, adaptive decision-making, and further planning when things don't go as expected, especially with tenure, which is sensitive. It, it sometimes becomes politically difficult, but it is necessary. So up, at what point do we know how to scale up? So unlike securing individual land titles, collective land titles are, are much more unique. They're costly and they're continuing. So many of our cases, even the ones I know that are, have just got the award today, took a long time took 15, 20 years, but we know even for shorter years and a year, there are qualitative results and shifts in behavior that happen. So we realize that at each point in land tenure recognition process, from active mapping to consultations, to verification of boundaries and signing of maps by local government officials, the indigenous peoples are producing evidence. They're positioning themselves in the much needed decision-making processes at the village, district, even provincial levels, influencing plans, land use plans and budgets, and at the same time, shifting behavior 
from exclusion to inclusion, from non -consult from non consultations to FPIC, from extractive to green development. And these decisions are subtle, but clearly because indigenous peoples are taking a stand and are considered to be players at and on the table, at the table, talking about these options. So this just as evidence-based claims at, the, at this point is shifting and changing behavior. So key for success, and this is ours, all of us that are providing these types of support in making a difference is, uh, I think we can recognize some of these points. First, upgrade communities' knowledge toolkits. Maps of community land are often incomplete, outdated, or use conflicting methodologies. And we kind of, we, we understand that, we help do that. In Liberia, we did that for the law in 2018 that recognized their rights. They didn't have, they have government support, they didn't have money, the government didn't have money. Bringing them together to build a common mapping methodology and to navigate the process for a communal application, it's a critical first step. Next is build trust, political will at the same time even when legislation recognizes community land rights. Political will, as I said earlier, uh, for implementation can be lacking. So um, an example of that is trust building in Panama. We all recognize and maybe support or co-support some of the, the efforts there. Meeting between government officials and indigenous leaders forged renewed confidence uh, and a major breakthrough in, 20, breakthrough in 2019 when the government publicly recognized central role of indigenous peoples in the country's forests and even protected areas. Strength and change makers, again, something we do together. Communities and government leaders often need technical assistance and land governance, for especially for land governance and titling. Uh, in Peru specifically, we funded a coalition to embed experts in key government agencies to expedite land governance and titling. This coalition resolved and uh, conflicts and successfully titled 11 million acres in three years. Again, this is not something we just did. It's a process where a lot of the work has already been done before we come in with a, an investment of substantial funding to assist. And four points, learn and share lessons globally by providing information and exchange platforms. We amplify and fast track successes. The Equator Prize is one unique, very good way of sharing lessons. So among indigenous peoples themselves and local communities, and between them and their supporters, it remains a crucial process, shared learning, exchanging, sharing tools. And uh, we found that uh, our yearly learning exchange, the one last in Bogota, Panama leaders shared their practices. It was implemented in, in Peru and in Indonesia, and these are successes that are being adapted. So lastly, we know this too. What, what works is when we know that indigenous peoples and local communities are communities acting together, co-investing, leveraging, they're not really beneficiaries. They are rights holders, they are co-investors. As we encourage this trust and inclusion, we also understand our role, especially in the tenure facility and our limits. We speak with other groups, other supporters, other funders, co-leveragers, because uh, we understand our work is in tenure and it's not in conservation per se, it's not in agroforestry, it's not in research, it's not in education, and it's not in livelihoods. And these are the kind of collaborative partnerships that we can establish uh, in, in this process and we are, are currently establishing. And uh, yes, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much and um, good, good evening from this part of the world. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Nonette, and thanks for staying up late. Um, we appreciate you know, raising the issue of collective land rights and recognition and the importance to access to financial resources for communities to actually work on this. You raise a really important issue, the issue of time, right? The investments are not quick, they take time, but in that time process, it's really providing the key upgrades to community tools, but also governments. It's helping to educate governments as well in this process and building that trust. So I think you highlight some really important elements that help support local action, but have this larger global impact. So I think there's a lot to learn from the tenure facility, so please visit their website. Now we're gonna move on to um, another mechanism um, called the Dedicated Grant Mechanism for Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities that looks at many issues, um, but it really focuses on providing direct access to Indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, and our speaker today will be Adrisa Seba, who is the Executive Director of Naturama in Burkina Faso, but he is also the co-chair 
of the Global Steering Committee for the Dedicated Grant Mechanism for Indigenous Peoples and Global and Local Communities. And he's gonna share some of the insights and lessons learned from the Dedicated Grant Mechanism. Adrisa, on to you. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Kristen, and uh, hi, everybody. Uh, sorry for this, uh, uh, for my, 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 uh, my language. It would be better for me to talk in, uh, in French, but um, I will try in English. So I apologize for, for the bad English you will hear from me. Uh, let's say um, we we thank too much UNDP and his partners to for for involving us into this uh, relevant session, and uh, we hope we will be able to 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 raise the profile of uh, indigenous people and local communities uh, into this uh, this session. Yes, what I'm I'm going to talk about is, uh, as as Christian said, is a DGM dedicated grant mechanism, which is a, a sub program uh, developed under the Forest Investment Program, uh, which is also one of the four main programs under the CIF, the Climate Investment Fund. And you know, uh, DGM uh, and FIP, they, they, they are all administered by World Bank. Uh, what I can say to introduce is, is that DGM is a, a program settled by local communities and indigenous people and run by them in more than 14 countries uh in uh, in three continents which a budget of more than 50 million us dollar and uh, which have also a global component uh, dedicated to learning sharing and uh, uh, iplc's network uh, strengthening with this compose this component is uh, managed by Conservation International uh, in, the, in, the, in the USA. Uh, what is the objective of the DGM? DGM aims to strengthen the capacity of indigenous people and local communities, what we call IPLCs, to participate in the forest investment program and other Red Plus program at local, national, and global uh, levels. As you know, uh, before this program, the IPLC people were facing uh, real difficulties to access funds. Uh, funds, I mean, uh, international climate finance funds. But with this DGM, since uh, 2015, uh, this kind of people that are not well taken into account into uh, former programs, they have possibility to access to these funds to develop small actions at, at, the, at the ground level in the fields, and that produce a lot of global impacts uh, broadly in, in the world. DGM is for now, since 19, uh, 2015, GGM is leading to broader and potentially more transformational effects that earlier predicted. DGM has substantive outcomes uh, for now and also enabling outcomes. Uh, in terms of uh, substantive outcome, we can, we can uh, notice better governance, higher recognition, Increase efficiency, improve land rights, better natural resource management, and income generation. Uh, on the side of enabling outcomes, we can say uh, GGM uh, increase sense of ownership of the mechanism, 
among the local community and indigenous people. Uh, it brings with trust and transparent governance. And you also heard about uh, this UNFCCC local communities and, and indigenous people platform, which is the platform set up uh, under the COP21 uh, agreement, Paris Agreement. This platform, uh, GGM, the global component of the GGM, uh, managed by Conservation International, was able to help the draft drafting of this uh, platform. And even now, these components continue helping uh, networks, indigenous people, and local communities' uh, involvement into this platform. You, you see forest, forest land rights for IPLCs are under emphasis as climate solution in most countries, a climate strategy. Working with IPLCs on land management is a fundamental strategy to mitigating climate change. As you know, yet only 21 countries included clear commitment to implement land and resource tenor initiative related to IPLC in, in their NDC, the nationally determined contributions. These NDCs represent less than 13% of the world tropical and subtropical forest area, meaning that most countries with tropical and subtropical forest are not formally connecting land rights with climate commitment. The LSIP platform could provide support to parties to integrating traditional indigenous and local knowledge system into climate action, including when designing and implementing nationally determined contribution. GGM is building the vertical connection from underground IPLC-led project to climate international policy through facilitating knowledge exchange between IPLC experts and capacity building on climate negotiation among local and regional leaders to be better equipped to engage at the global level. This platform is an opportunity for local knowledge holders exchange in the regional meeting to identify best available practices and information and transform into policy under UNFCCC for climate uh, action. Uh, let's say, uh, I, as, as Christian said, I'm also uh, the, the, the national, I'm also president chairing the, 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 the national component of this DGM in Burkina Faso. What I can just say to, 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 to underline what I was saying before is that in Burkina Faso, in a time of global uncertainty, turbulence, and Aten trends, DGM IPLCs are responding to the current COVID-19 pandemic in innovative and adaptive ways that are rooted in community resilience and indigenous and local knowledge system. GGM Burkina Faso is implementing the use of monitoring and electronic data collection tools to follow up on activity implementing uh, implementation during COVID-19. In the case of Burkina Faso, to address the barrier IPLC women face in project governance, the program developed specific selection criteria during micro and sub-project evaluation, which has resulted in women-led organization implementing over 50% of the programs, 90, 80, 85 community initiative. As of June 2020, GGM Burkina Faso has approved a total of 85 sub-projects and micro-projects for implementation, including that is wonderful, Idrissa.
Um, that is wonderful to hear the progress of the DGM in Burkina Faso, um, and we appreciate all those efforts. I think you highlight a really important factor. We've talked about promoting engagement with indigenous peoples and local communities and influencing policy. We've talked about landscape, livelihoods, and culture. We've talked about the importance of collective tenure, and you highlight a really important thing, access to resources, but governance plus the important role that women have to play in these efforts. So we appreciate um, your contribution to this uh, dialogue and discussion and the messages that you've sent regarding scaling up and putting those decisions in the hands of indigenous peoples and local communities. We're gonna transition now. Um, we've spent a, a lot of time looking at the issues of um, forest communities or local communities. And we're gonna talk a little bit um, with Kobe Brand, who's with ICLE. And we're gonna talk about the communities with nature partnership and understanding what that looks like in more of an urban context and communities with nature. Kobe, we'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kristen. And also, I just want to take this opportunity to congratulate UNDP for this wonderful platform, Nature for Life, Hub, uh, just the day before uh, the UN Summit on Biodiversity. So thank you very much for the opportunity from ICLE. Um, for those who don't know ICLE, we're the largest and oldest local government association, cities association, focused on sustainability. And um, I think celebrating our 30 year anniversary this year, we're very proud to say that we've got a very strong community of cities across the world, large and small, that are focused on biodiversity and nature-based solutions. Um, so we understand that the global crises that we are facing, brought to the fore currently through COVID-19, um, need to be addressed at city level. More than half of the world's population actually do live in cities already, and it's in these urban communities. We're almost the perfect nexus in a city, which brings together business, industry, uh, urban communities, uh, uh, local government leaders, mayors, but also the urban communities and the population where most of us also make a living and live our lives. So here we would often think nature does not, doesn't have a place. And a few decades ago, that was probably the case. You know, nature was pushed outside. But remarkably, nature is right here. And it's if, if we don't get it right in our cities, in our towns, we are not going to win the fight against uh, the destruction of nature, habitat loss, etc. But we can with nature-based solutions and with embracing nature. And that is why um, cities with nature is such a fundamental part of what we do these days. Cities with nature is a powerful network of cities uh, with, with partners from around the world, the founding partners were the Nature Conservancy, ICLE, IUCN, and we now have over 15 partners, including WWF, UNEP, many others that are embracing this concept of connecting cities together uh, to learn, share, exchange and absolutely inspire each other, but also to commit publicly and report publicly in terms of what they're doing to embrace nature and mainstream nature in all the activities, their development activities, but also the activities uh, to address climate change, to address many of the other global and, and manifested locally uh, problems at scale. Um, so nature, cities with nature uh, currently has over 170 pioneer cities, large and small, from around the world that have felt a need uh, to connect with each other on nature. Many, many cities connect already on climate and on many other topics, but connecting specifically on mainstreaming nature and embracing biodiversity is relatively a new concept. And realizing that these nature-based solutions are long-lasting and actually very cost-effective have made these cities stand out. And just to give you an example, maybe not all of us know that almost as many trees exist and grow and thrive in the city, Greater London uh, uh, Local Authority, than there are citizens in London. We're looking at 9 million people living in London, 40,000 residents per square uh, mile. But did we know that 15,000 different species of plants and animals also live in London, um, from wild birds to um, many other species and um, I think the, you know connecting this these urban areas with each other is just astounding we see it also in Melbourne one of our many other pioneering cities where Melbourne has embraced a bold new living Melbourne 
our Metrop Metropolitan Urban Forest Initiative, which connects our green open spaces with each other in green corridors, um, bringing forward um, spaces for, for lots of species that were pushed outside of, of uh, urban environments. And never more than during this pandemic have people realized how much is at stake when they cannot access nature, when they cannot access their parks and green safe open spaces. So one of the aims of Cities with Nature is also to promote protected areas and to promote the access, safe access and easy access for all sorts of communities to access green, green uh, spaces and nature in their in the day-to-day lives. And one primary example of that is the city of um, 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 Montreal, for instance, which is currently establishing the largest urban park in the world um, that will uh, be far greater than, for instance, Central Park in New York City, connecting green corridors with each other and embracing wildlife, um, bringing, bringing wildlife back into cities, but embracing wildlife and other habitats to um, to flourish and bringing nature closer to people for people's health, well-being, but also for nature and for planet. So Cities with Nature is something new. It's just about two, over two, three years old, not even three years old yet. And already we see hundreds of cities. And during the pandemic, interestingly enough, almost a city per day joined Cities with Nature. So, and we still see this snowballing effect of cities wanting to embrace the concept. Singapore, of course, is a a wonderful example, a city state, which is called, uh, you know, a, a garden, a city within a garden, where nature is absolutely and fundamentally embraced. But there's so many other cities um, here in my uh, continent where I live, South Africa, in, in Durban, for instance, there are community-based projects where, where cities with nature uh, absolutely embrace community-based initiatives in urban communities. And uh, just over the last few years, these urban communities have planted almost close to a million new trees and restoring and cleaning up their rivers, etc. So we understand and, and we know that there are at least 38, at least 40 reasons I can give you right now for why cities need to embrace nature. And one of it is that if we do not, and if we do not act with nature and mainstream nature, the new global biodiversity framework, these new targets that we'll formulate and agree upon next year in China will not be met. So it's at the local level, in our cities, with our urban communities, where action needs to happen and where global deals manifest and need to be implemented. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I'd love to uh, spend more time with you, but you're welcome to visit Cities with Nature. And if you're a city listening and tuning in, please join us now. It's free and easy. Come become part of the family. Thank you very much, Kristen. Thanks, Kobe. I think you, know, you highlighted a very important issue is the issue of cities and we often forget those focuses that there is nature in cities um, and I think COVID has really highlighted those efforts that many people are remaining in cities they're out and about more so the opportunities to make individual commitments community commitments but government commitments and as you said a lot of these negotiations happen in cities so they are just equally as important as to our forest and our marine areas and the ability to scale up but as you said it's scaled up already with COVID um, we could do more. So thanks so much. Um, we're gonna end this segment um, with another video um, highlighting a little bit more of the work of communities through the DGM, um, and then we'll set up for our panel. So on to the video. Climate change is the defining challenge of our time, and forests offer a natural solution by removing carbon from the atmosphere. Indigenous peoples and local communities manage much of the world's forested land making them key players in global efforts to combat climate change. Created and led by members of these communities, the dedicated grant mechanism, DGM, supports their roles in sustainable forest management at all levels of decision-making. For example, in Burkina Faso, women from local communities use DGM support to improve their production and marketing of non-timber forest products, such as Simbala, a popular West African condiment. This increases revenue and encourages continued forest protection. Indigenous federations in Peru seek legal recognition, land titling, and food security of native communities, strengthening their traditional management of land and addressing drivers of deforestation in Amazonia. 
communities in Indonesia are developing essential skills to secure land tenure, promote sustainable livelihoods, and engage in policy making related to deforestation and landscape management. Indigenous peoples and local communities are also coming together at regional and global levels to share their expertise, develop skills, and become more effective leaders in climate action. The world needs forests, and forests need indigenous peoples and local communities. Learn more at dgmglobal.org. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our participants uh, in the East. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished speakers and panelists, members of the media and participants from around the world, thank you for participating and attending um, uh, day four of the Nature for Life event and this session entitled Local Action, Global Impact. So we just heard from five incredible conservation practitioners with real life experience on what works on the ground in biodiversity hotspots across the world. We've heard from Mesoamerica, from Africa, from Southeast Asia. So we've heard from the East, from the West, but also from both urban and rural environments. These stories are indeed stories of success um, that we are extremely proud of then, and they are extremely le relevant to all of us. My name is Razan Al Mubarak. I'm the Managing Director of the Environment Agency in Abu Dhabi, and I'll be your moderator for the second half of, to of today's sessions, where we will hear from distinguished panelists about how to accelerate the scaling up of initiatives that help protect and conserve nature. We are extremely fortunate to have a wealth of expertise and leadership represented today, coming from finance, from youth, from government, and the private sector. So let us begin. Um, I will let or allow each speaker to present their ideas on how they might identify uh, pathways for accelerating the scaling up of conservation solutions. Each speaker will speak for around three to four minutes. And if we all uh, stick to our time allotments, we will have plenty of time of what I'm sure will be a very engaging Q&A session. Um, so um, let me turn the virtual floor to a very dear friend, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, the CEO of the Global <laughs> Environmental Fund. Mr. Rodriguez, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Rasan. It, it is a real pleasure to, to see you and to be in this panel. And of course, um, I want to thank uh, UNDPCI for, for putting together uh, this uh, great event. Um, and, and, and let me just begin by saying that I'm really, really impressed by the work that has been done um, in DGM. DGM, for me, addresses uh, is the glue that uh, we needed to bring together many different things, uh, conservation of biodiversity, mitigation and adaptation to climate change, rights uh, <clears throat> recognition of uh, land and environmental services to indigenous communities, and forest conservation. You know, we've been working on those, all of those uh, items uh, for many decades, uh, but TGM has brought them all together. And I have uh, high expectations that the TGM uh, initiative can can really do a couple of things. One is to empower local communities and indigenous communities as our biggest stewards for the ecosystem uh, conservation and forest uh, restoration. Uh, and the second is that um, there's a, a great opportunity, the day that we all agree on a international uh, carbon forest market that the, these communities uh, will have the opportunity to, to really improve, improve not just in economic terms, but um, intellectual and in uh, social terms as well. 
And uh, that is why it is extremely important that uh, we are able to generate consensus on how we implement the Paris uh, Agreement, particularly on, on Article 6. We will continue losing forests no matter what, uh, unless we agree on national and international mechanisms by which those who own the land and care for the land are recognized uh, uh, economically for the services that they provide at the local and international level. And carbon is one of the key elements here. And I, and I think that this is extremely, extremely important because at this point, there is no, no ongoing process that can really uh, establish a, a economic recognition for the services that the, the owners of forests, uh, being indigenous communities, governments, or private sector or small farmers, uh, provide. And uh, we, we need to generate that, that, uh, that consensus and that agreement. And also, we need to really pay the real price for the service they provide. Today, the, the price for carbon forests is very low, five to seven dollars. And that's, that does not match the cost of opportunity of doing carbon ranching and other or in, uh, in other, other kind of uh, economic activities that we don't want to see in those landscapes. We don't want uh, the um, uh, deforestation to continue. So it is extremely important, extremely important that we generate uh, a general uh, consensus and it is extremely important that uh, a, a, under that consensus, we will be able to generate a fair price. In this context, uh, the GF has been playing a major role. We've been able through the, this um, new um, cycle, JAT7, uh, able to provide up to $25 million for uh, within our inclusive uh, conservation initiatives uh, uh, funding to indigenous communities that has been, you know, doing an excellent work. But uh, most importantly, we we want to, you know, however, uh, we, we are also pushing for indigenous people and local communities throughout the, you know, the broad uh, work that um, that um, GF uh, does uh, at uh, in terms of our portfolio. I, I would like to, you know, make a final comment, comment here as I'm saying that the GF funds are not enough to, to move the needle towards where we need it. So we need to be very strategic on how we do our investment. And in the last uh, few years, we've been able to move from, from dealing with the problem towards dealing with the root cause of the, of the problem. And in order to upscale and amplify our impact, we need all within the broader GF partnership to understand that the GF funding are not resources for governments, are resources for countries. And in this respect, countries has the, the responsibility to bring on board all stakeholders. And indigenous communities and, and uh, farmers' communities are key in the solution. Thank you so much. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Jose Fatauli, and I'm an Ibaloy Kankanay Garot from the Philippines. And I'm with the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, or GYBN. And GYBN is the um, youth constituency to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, I'm also with the ICCA Consortium, which is a consortium that's working to uphold territories of life of indigenous peoples and local communities. And I'm happy to join you today from the Philippines. Um, so when we speak about local action for global impact, this is exactly what indigenous peoples and local communities have been doing for generations. And that's not something that's just benefiting themselves, um, but it's very much benefiting the whole of society. Um, indigenous peoples and local communities through their collective actions on the ground um, are making substantial contributions to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, which we all rely on for our survival and for our well-being. Um, additionally, um, indigenous values show us the way um, in terms of what systems could look like when they are addressing the current crises at the same time, um, leaving no one behind. So to scale this up, we need to address the many challenges 
um, that are um, preventing indigenous peoples and local communities from stewarding nature and that are hindering their local actions, um, like the lack of secure land tenure in many places and the continued attacks against them, and also to learn from their very rich um, indigenous and local knowledge. So in terms of youth, um, we in the Global Youth Biodiversity Network um, are doing great work in making global impact by bringing the voices of youth on the ground um, into decision-making spaces like the CBD, but also um, by fostering collaboration among diverse youth um, and empowering them to take action for biodiversity in their own countries. Um, we know that for solutions on biodiversity to work, um, they should be suited to social and environmental context. And that's why um, the work of our national and regional chapters um, is so valuable uh, because uh, they need, because biodiversity work is very important to happen um, at, from the bottom up also. And so to scale this up, young people everywhere need to be supported um, and engaged in a very accessible, respectful, and meaningful way at all levels. Um, with the institutional mechanisms in place to do so. Um, finally, uh, one last point is that to measure our success and to know whether we are scaling up or not, we really need to know how much impact these local actions are making at a global scale. And this means that we need the indicators and the disaggregated data to monitor um, how much the contributions are really of indigenous peoples and local communities um, of women and of youth. And this is something that needs to be um, reflected in policy, including in the post-2020 framework. So um, I think I'll end there. Uh, thank you. Great. Um, you have me back again because Rasan lost um, connectivity. So I'll continue to moderate. And if we get her back, she might appear again. So I'd like to pass. Um, the, the introductions to Deputy Permanent Representative of the Kingdom of Bhutan. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, and greetings from the Permanent Mission of Bhutan to the United Nations in New York. I am pleased to be here among a panel of uh, distinguishers, uh, and I have been asked to uh, learn on the role of local communities play in the sustainable management of the system and how they can further engage them in build, uh, building up their knowledge. Uh, please allow me to start, uh, uh, set the context before I dive into the question. As you may be aware that Bhutan is a small uh, kingdom, which is part of one of the 10 biodiversity hotspots of the world. Uh, and in spite of the pressures of economic growth and urbanization, Bhutan has been blessed uh, early on with the leadership foresight that environment and ecological sustainability must be both at the primary ob objective and the starting point of national development within the framework of our development philosophy of gross national happiness. Uh, such a leadership foresight has steered us firmly on this sustainable path. Now, how do you sustain this? It is here the role of local communities comes in. As bold local actions have the potential to address challenges of natural laws in a holistic manner. For a predominantly agricultural country, the RNR sector plays an important role in improving the country's economy, livelihoods, and environment. It contributes 17.4% 17, 17 to the national GDP and employs a close to about 50% of the total population. Here, I am happy to share some of the community level initiatives that is proving beneficial in natural resource management in Bhutan. Here, I wish to highlight the Gumri Water Project carried out under the Community Development and Knowledge Management for Satoyama Initiative Comdex and UNDP SGP projects in Eastern Bhutan, which responds to the challenges faced by local communities from growing pressures on the landscape, from grazing, over extraction of fodder and pure wood, 
landslides, drying up of oil sources, and human wildlife conflict. Under this project, about 226 hectares of agricultural land has been brought under the sound ecological production system, benefiting over 895 community members. 52 river water sources have been protected, significantly contributing to the overall improvement of soil fertility, restoration of local systems, and providing community, mem community members with access to clean drinking water. This project also, also helped identify alternative sources of income generation for the local community. In addition, the Royal Government has also taken communities on board to ensure the ownership of, uh, the, ownership of the natural resources around them. For instance, unlike in the past, the forest management system has shifted from centralized management to a participatory one. The local communities are now responsible for the management of forests and its resources. Through management regimes such as community forest management groups, non forest product management groups, and watershed management groups. As of now, Bhutan has more than 800 community forests and over 114 non wood forest management groups. Communities also take lead role in watershed management activities through the payment of system services. PES schemes. At present, there are about four such schemes in the country. Under these schemes, the downstream community like municipals, industries, hoteliers pay a certain amount to the upstream community, like we are local people residing in watershed area, on an annual basis for carrying out watershed uh, management uh, activities. So. Some key factors behind the success of the EPA projects and other community engagement initiatives in Bhutan is due to its strong focus on community engagement and ownership of the process. Local traditional knowledge and practices associated with the landscape and natural uh, resources management is also an important factor. I'll stop here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Karma. L great to hear you. Uh, uh, the Kingdom of Bhutan has always been extremely innovative in developing new sustainable pathways. Um, but really, that's now a, um, a, a new pathway that we're going lis to uh, listen from, and that is a uh, representative from the private sector. Here with us in the virtual platform, we have Sarah Maston. Um, Sarah, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, such a great panel. I've been watching the other talks. Um, I'm from Microsoft. I am a solution architect. Um, and I, I'm really happy to talk about a collaboration we've been doing with the Small Grants Program. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you a bit of an origin story of a project called Project 15. So normally I work on commercial solutions um, in the internet of things, which is IOT. Um, and I had designed a safety platform a few years ago, which was all about making safe workplaces, safe schools, safe cities. And when I met uh, a man named Eric Dinnerstein, um, he introduced me to the use case of anti-poaching. And of course, I, I knew what poaching was, but as a technologist, I always felt very powerless. I didn't know how I could help. But once I thought about it, it was another use case for safety. And so, you know, you take that and it was an aha moment. And you think about, you know, shoplifting or loss prevention in a store. What was the real difference between a sweater in a big store and making sure it doesn't get stolen or a pangolin in a park and making sure it doesn't get stolen. And once you could see that our commercial use cases, you know, solutions could apply to these use cases, I paired up with a colleague of mine named Daisuke Nakahara and we started to think about how could we scale and accelerate scientific projects by connecting 
um, technologists like us from our community to the scientific community. So about six months ago, we started working with the small grants program and we're given three projects to work with in our nighttime and weekend hours and map their processes, their technologies, connected devices, whether it's a collar on an elephant or it's a camera trap, they're, they're really just the same as any other connected device. And, but we had some real problems to solve and one of them was a skills gap. It, it's not easy to you know, learn everything about getting a platform like that going. Um, the funding model is a little different than a public company. Um, there's not going to be an IPO. Um, you know. So within a granting model, how could we really make those investments go longer and last more? And during our Microsoft company hackathon, um, it's a time where Microsoft gives three days for people all over the, uh, the company and countries and world to come together to make something. And so we grabbed a few more friends and we created an open platform uh, for Project 15 and put it out on GitHub. And what that means by open sourcing it, it's a free piece of software that anyone can deploy into Azure and it's about 80% of a solution. And when you think about it, dev costs go down, that's a way to make that, that funding budget stretch. And then you're really just focusing on that 20%. What's your use case and how do you need to modify this to make it work? Not unlike a word processor where you're just writing a book, um, you know, but without that word processor, it would take a long time. And um, so this opened up the sense of community and the open source community where developers can contribute to this project, Folks at Microsoft are contributing to this project and it really opens up the space for uh, universities can use it and, and of course the scientific community. So that's what uh, we've been doing over here um, at Microsoft. And in addition to that, you know, when you think about IoT, it's really at the center of sustainability solutions. And so we, we really feel this is an opportunity to expedite and accelerate these important solutions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It's been um, eye-opening, and I hope that you continue um, this path towards uh, innovation for addressing some of the 21st century greatest challenges. So this is the time when we are open for a, a Q&A session. And I have a question for uh, Carlos. Carlos, um, the question is as follows. Um, how has or is the GEF increasing its efforts um, to, uh, a, um, um, to increase indigenous and local community access to financial resources? Well, the, as, um, thank you, Rasan. And I was very impressed by everything that was said by, by my colleagues, uh, panelists, which, uh, which uh, were able to bring different different angles uh, to the same challenge, and, and that is, you know, beautiful. Having having a representative of the uh, of the youth about diversity network is great. You know, Bhutan, what they are doing is fabulous, and Sarah, you, you blow my mind with uh, what you are doing. That, that is fabulous. We at the at the GF understand that, you know, once more, Rasan, that. We, we can double and triple our trust fund and that won't make any uh, difference in terms of moving the needle towards sustainability and conservation. We need to be very smart. That, that is why we have developed this very innovative impact program where we understand how do we amplify and upscale. So let's talk about forests. You know, we had a huge challenge in terms of uh, forest conservation and we have understand that uh, it won't be until we empower and assist local communities that we can be able to upscale and amplify. It's not just going down to the to the field, to the ground level, and do what we did in, in the past by creating new protected areas or corridors. We can amplify that a hundred times if we understand how do we catalyze uh, our resources uh, with local communities and indigenous groups. And also at the same time, we have understood that uh, the big challenge is not necessarily mobilizing more resources. Uh, that won't be enough. Uh, we need to do a combination of uh, defunding deforestation and pollution at the global level, but at the same time, if we create the market opportunities 
for those who are stewarding our forests uh, to access uh, a fair price for the environmental services they provide. It can be water, it can be biodiversity, it, it can be carbon. That will give us the possibility to really be working at a scale that we never before were working. So for us at the GF, it's very clear the role of indigenous communities and local communities, small farmers in, in this context. And we work not, not just in mobilizing resources, but understanding how do we also make them more resilient to uh, big uh, challenges, particularly climate change. So ecosystem-based adaptation is, is a cost-effective way by which we can work in terms of food security with small uh, communities and, uh, and, and avoiding those uh, big uh, challenges that we are confronting uh, today. W wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go back to you, Sarah, because you know we talked about um, or Carla spoke about, you know, it's not, you know, it's not necessarily um, more, more, more capital. But how do we amplify existing capital towards um, community conservation efforts and solutions? And what is your vision, really, for the Project uh, 15 and the Small Grants Program? So, I mean, that's that's really the the key to. Um, you know, working smarter, not harder, um, which is always, you know, finding those processes. And if you look at, you know, the Microsoft platform is working really hard, especially on Azure to bring these technologies to people in a much less complex way. So we're following that methodology um, and also reaching across to other, um, you know, friends across Microsoft. So we've partnered with our academic arm and some folks that are working on uh, uh, undergraduate and graduate capstone programs and being able to partner NGO uh, companies with students on a base platform. And then that gets to inch along these projects as well towards the, the finish line. Um, sometimes leaps and bounds, sometimes it might be a, an advancement in a machine learning model. Um, so that's really exciting. A absolutely. And you mentioned students. And uh, when you mentioned students, my, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you, uh, Josefa. Um, perhaps you can uh, set, shed uh, some light on um, some of the challenges that um, the uh, youth community is 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 currently facing and 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 particularly if there are challenges that you face in in getting involved in in the new green deal mm -hmm. uh thank thank you Rizan. so um well in in coming up like with new policies on the environment uh it will be very crucial to listen to youth voices um to make sure that these policies are effective and that they are starting us on the right foot um, towards addressing biodiversity loss, especially um, with the, all the reprioritization repri after COVID. Um, and so uh, there needs to be, again, like I said, a very meaningful engagement of young people. Young people still face a lot of uh, uh, tokenism and um, and so, uh we we need to ensure that our actions uh and uh are meaningfully and um accessibly empowering youth and um this means that for example we need to be supporting youth led projects because young people are still often looked at as just a, a recipient or a beneficiary um it also means involving them from the very beginning um, during the planning phase of these projects, because this is not often the case. Um, another challenge is uh, young people are often being brought in and people uh, think that one young person represents the views of youth at large, even though youth is such a diverse group. Um, and so efforts need to be made to reach more youth and more diverse youth. And um, finally, like there, there's still not enough um, mechanisms to ensure that we're able to fully and effectively participate and there's not also enough resources to support us to, su to participate. Um, in terms of uh, indigenous youth, just to go a bit more particular, 
we are faced um we have a lot of significant contributions but the challenges are also very significant um like many indigenous youth are on the forefront of uh defending the environment and defending communities but the very hostile and the very unequal situations around the world um means that the forefront is not a very safe place to be and so uh we need to in, like address the things like the lack of access to culturally appropriate education uh, which is causing us to lose our traditional knowledge and languages um there's also the continued um uh discrimination and assimilation that's causing uh that's threatening our um indigenous identities and finally like uh we need to address the insecure land tenure that many indigenous peoples face so um maybe i'll stop there thank you Zafa, you're you're incredible. Um, I think your your message is loud and clear. We need to start. We catch all phrase, and there is much diversity within within um, within this acting actor group. I'm going to jump in here because I'm not quite sure if you can hear me. I'm going to jump in because Razan is having some technical difficulties. Um, I just want to ask one one question to you each with a very short answer. What has to happen to scale up local action in two in a short phrase? Carlos Benuel. Well, we need to conserve everything that we can as soon as possible. We need to restore everything that doesn't conflict food production, where we live or how we generate our energy. Uh, we need to fund big time conservation. And at the same time, we need to defund those activities that generate land use change, deforestation and pollution. Sarah, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I, I would say that anyone can help. Whatever skills you have, you may not think that you can contribute, but you can. Zepa? Um, indigenous peoples and local communities, women, youth, um, we're all often you know, like marginalized from decision making and we're all often referred to as vulnerable. But in reality, um, the conditions, policies, and institutions um, need, just need to be supportive and equitable for our impact to really um, be uh at the scale that we want it and so um our local like since our local actions are already having global impact despite the many challenges that we face to scale this up um we must support these groups and ensure that the enabling conditions for them to continue their efforts to their full potential are present Great. Well, I want to thank all of our panel and, um, you know, we're living in a virtual world. So it's technology. We, we adapt to, to our situation. So we appreciate Rasan and her moderation. Um, and thank you all. I think what we want to do is sum up today is really look at one is how you support indigenous peoples and in local communities and recognize their efforts and their guardianship in their territories, be it forest and communities. We need to look at not seeing indigenous peoples in local communities and peoples in cities, not as vulnerable, but empowered and support them to be empowered. I think as Sarah said, anyone can join and anyone can bring the idea to the table. I think we need to move as a collective. We need to be able to support local action by helping to bring tools, learn from tools of local communities and inc incorporate that with technology. Um, and then we also do need to look at the larger values we all have for nature and how our local action through expressing our values in nature supports global impact. So thank you all for your time today. I hope this session was impactful for you. It was for me. Um, and I want to congratulate all of our speakers and our panelists on all their efforts and all the Equator Prize winners of today. So thank you very much and stay tuned. Thank you to our dynamic panel for this discussion. After a short break, we will reconvene for the last session of the day and of the hall, talking about the future of our Earth's biggest advocates, environmental defenders. As always,
please contribute to the rich online discussion with the hashtag Nature for Life. Visit us at the official UNDP Twitter account at UNDP Life or at natureforlifehub.org. See you soon.